So, welcome back to the show. Uh, this episode, I am chatting with Mick Hawks, QCB, uh, prestigious title. Not easily won- uh, earned, are they? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but who doesn't like a chocolate coin? Um, so, yes, thank you, Mick, for agreeing to come on the show today. Uh, I've been looking forward to this for for uh, for quite a while. Actually, it took me a while to get hold to uh, remember actually to get in touch with you in the first place. <laughs> I've got a head like a sieve. So, welcome, Mick. Thanks very much. Uh, my my pleasure, and uh, thanks for having us on. Uh, and it's uh, yeah, it's always always good to to try and get your uh, your story out there, I suppose. And and because we're a bit of a new entity in the security market, uh, yeah. with a lot of experience. Um, we we actually uh, rely on some of the podcasts really to to get us known uh, known out there. Uh, so it's yeah. Uh, thanks for thanks for the invite. Much appreciated. No, it's a pleasure. It's um, there's you've got you got um, what you're doing particularly at the moment is is of of interest to me because of as we were speaking about earlier where I live, very rural, um, and I think it's important to get that message out there what you're doing and and well, hopefully get you some more business for one thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, uh, unfortunately, with uh, what I mean, what we're trying to do um, is is uh, it's all about helping people. You know, yep. be it farmers, ten-year-old uh, kids, youngsters. You know, it, it's all about you know making sure they're they're safe against against bad people. Uh, and there are bad people out there that just take advantage, as we we've, we've seen in the uh, but the, yep. the rural industry and and, and retail, for instance. Uh, yes, but they. Yes. But the the, uh, the the problem we've got really uh, is convincing the people that that they their people need help, um, and and a, a big one for us is obviously the the farming industry uh, where they seem to be happy uh, just to 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 muddle on uh, losing fifty four million um, pound a year uh, with losses and stuff like that. They they just seem to be happy to just go with the flow and. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. you know it needs someone to rattle the cage, bang on the door, uh, shout and scream, because uh, that lunatic that's banging on the door generally has a has a good idea <laughs> and just wants to be heard. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's usually the people who spotted the gaps, isn't it? Yeah, and uh, and have have something to something constructive to fill that with, and and anything that I can do to to help spread that word for you is uh, you know. Because it's bloody important. The world is going to hell in a handbasket at the moment. So, no, absolutely. Because uh, yeah, funny old, funny old story. But I, I live in rural Herefordshire. I, I now live on a farm, uh, the posh part of the farm, by the way. The, the work inside of it is on the other side. So, so I don't get all the, <laughs> don't get all the smells that go with living on a farm. So, yeah, I'm, I'm behind the mansion. There's a mansion behind me, and I'm in the, the farm cottage. So okay, it's fantastic. Uh, really, really good. But. Uh, oh, before by April, um, from 2002, uh, May 2002 until April this year, I lived um, in a place called Winferton, uh, which is a, a little rural town or village uh, on the Brecon Road, leaving yep. Hereford. Um, and my next door neighbour was a farmer. Um, and, and literally a light bulb moment, uh, I was taking the, the dogs for a walk in the field. And, uh, and then we, we just heard the news that, um, you know, rural crime, blah, blah, blah. And I just thought, hold on, um, we can help the farmers here. Um, and, and it all stemmed from our undercover days in Northern Ireland where we used to break into farms, uh, you know, yes. covertly. And covertly breaking into a farm is a lot harder than actually breaking into a farm anyway, uh, if I, you know, because you can smash a window. Uh, yeah. So do so we we actually got really good <laughs> um, at, at, at breaking in, like you know, uh, legal yeah. legal criminals. Uh, I think they used to call it. Um, and we just yeah, thought, absolutely. you know, with that, yeah, with that that mindset of uh, you know the old gamekeeper or poacher turned gamekeeper. Yes. Um, and and that's where it all stemmed from. Really, is is understanding uh, how these criminals operate and and trying to educate uh, because unfortunately with the farm industry. There is absolutely zero security culture uh, within the farming industry. You can you can go on any farm, any farm in, in uh, the UK, uh, and there'll be a vehicle with the keys in the ignition, uh, yeah. or you know, some on there. And, and and unfortunately, that's why criminals target the the rural industry because they know um, that it's easy pickings. Uh, 
and and what people tend to forget, and I've seen all these, um, you know, security companies coming out saying that you know this is our plan, this is our plan, and you read it, um, but not one of them actually focuses on the the actual core of a problem, which is the farmers. You know, yeah. you can have CCTV, uh, you can have uh, you know the the rural crime units doing their thing. But the key to it all is the, the farmers themselves, because you know they could be doing their job right, uh, and they're not actually. But you know they could be doing their job right. Um, but if a farmer leaves a gate open, you know you you you're stuck like you know. So yeah. so what ours ours is, um, and we've already been told this by the rural crime unit down in Wiltshire, that that what we offer is is actually the missing link to what they're trying to do. So you've got the rural crime units trying to do their thing. Yeah, you technology doing its thing. Uh, which is only as good as the people operating it, um, and then you, you know, the farmers are the ones that actually bring it all together, and, and people tend to forget that the importance that the the actual farmer plays in that, and 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 this is where we're trying to uh, trying to be be different uh, because unfortunately farmers, as, uh, if we offer assistance to a farmer, the first thing that comes out of his mouth is uh, how much is this going to cost me? Yeah. Um, yeah. So what we what we've decided is um, the the people that should be hiring me are the insurance companies for one, or yes. the National Farming Union, because what we what we can do is we can take the burden off the rural crime units um, because a lot of the time they don't have time to go and investigate uh, what's going on. So I'm not saying that we're going to investigate, but what what we will do is we can go to the farm after it's been broken into. And actually help them to improve their security. Uh, yeah. And the other one is you're also helping the the insurance companies. But everything is done free of charge uh, to the farmer. Uh, and if and if you know you go to a farmer and say, listen, I can help you. It's not going to cost you a penny. Um, let's use what you've got available now. You know, let's disguise your uh, your refueling point. You know, let, let's try and get that out of the way. Let's move all your stuff out of sight, out of mind. Uh, if you don't want vehicles going into that area, then you know let, let's let's put six-inch nails in a block of wood, and you know make sure that if people yeah. do go in there, it's the last thing that they'll ever do. Like you know, and and the other the other important thing is, is confrontation. Um, the farmers themselves, if, if they're always told by the police, uh, anything you do with confrontation, walk away and go into uh, and go and hide yourself in a, in a, in a barn or in a, in the you know, the farm itself, yeah, uh, and, that, and that's not really helping the farmers. Uh, farmers need to be aware of what what they can do and what they can't do when it comes to confrontation. So, so we do conflict management, um, and uh, and it, and it's not about hiding away. You know, sometimes yeah, yeah, you have to actually go out there and and uh, and deal with what what the issues are. You can't just keep running away like you know and uh, and stuff like that. So. Yeah, it's it's about helping the farmers, but but you know, putting an arm around them as opposed to giving them guidelines and and ripping them off, really. Um, yeah, a, a normal security company, for instance, will go onto a farm and say, right, first thing you're going to do, we're going to do a security assessment. Well, all you're doing is, is you're, you're highlighting what the farmer already knows. Yeah, because the farmer knows his farm much better than any outside security guy. So, so that straight away, that's going to cost about ten grand ish, um, just just to do the assessment, and then on the back of that, there'll be lots of recommendations how to improve your security, um, and and it, you know that could po probably come to about forty thousand pounds. You know, Fort Knox. You know, you need CCTV, you need monitoring devices, blah blah blah, and the the, the farmer looks at it and just uh, forty. He hasn't got forty grand to to improve his no. thing. So, so they rip it up, and and absolutely nothing gets done. Uh, so that that criminal cycle continues. But if you was to go there and say, "Listen, mate, you know, let's improve the security. Forget that forty thousand. You know, let, let's use what we've got available now." And it's a bit like what we did. That we went to Dartmoor uh, to help a farmer. They just lost forty thousand pounds worth of equipment um, and reported it to the police. Police never came out. Uh, they just gave a crime number. So a good friend of mine, who's a friend of a farmer, said, "Mick, can you come and help? Uh, come and you know, give him some advice." However, the farmer wants to know how much it's going to cost, and I went, "Listen, you pay for the the fuel down from Hereford down to Dartmoor. 
um, and I want a bacon sandwich, um, you know, when I get there. <laughs> that's it, you know. So we, get, we got down yeah. there, spent, literally spent five hours on the farm and, and uh, you know, saying, right, let's move. And they have one CCTV camera. I said, listen, let's move it. Because literally you could you could stand there and, and touch it. So, so it was, you know, and criminals yeah. could do that. So I said, listen, let, let's let's put your camera where it's where it's going to be more uh, more beneficial. Uh, they they had two lights that weren't really doing much, so we got moving lights. So again, costing them nothing. Uh, they had uh, two top of the range um, uh, quads uh, and an all terrain vehicle parked, uh, and the keys were in it. Uh, and they basically, we were walking with the farmer down the main road, and we looked left into the courtyard and and you could just see the and i said oh they, they, they look nice let's go and have a look anyway he sent his son uh forward and and really the son was there to try and take the keys out but we we caught him taking the keys out I said listen mate you know if, if i know they're there then criminals will know that as well yep and so it, so it was really just doing a lot of practical uh common sense stuff with a bit of lateral thinking uh if that makes sense yep but, one of the worst things was they, they've got working dogs because uh, there's a lot of sheep and, and cows um, uh, with the farm. Uh, so they, they need these uh, working dogs. And he had, he had five of them. Now, each of these dogs is probably worth about 10 grand. Um, yeah. At night time, you know, they're, they're just loose in the, in the courtyard. Uh, as soon as criminals click onto that, you know, they'll be in and they'll be stealing the dogs like, you know, and yeah. so listen, you need, to, you need to secure, you know, and they're a big asset really to the, you know, you take the dogs away from the farm. Yeah. The farm yeah. is absolutely, uh, you know, in bits like, you know, and trying to work. So, so it was all about really going down there, practical, put an arm around them, help them out, good advice, common sense advice. Um, and and already their their security of the farm has improved tenfold. Uh, so when when these criminals come back, which they will do, you know if they've yeah. got away with it once, they'll come back. Uh, at least they're gonna they're gonna have a bit of a rough ride, <laughs> um, yeah. you know, with the breaking. Because we we mentioned about these, you know, we, we call it cold truck uh, in the military, which is you know yes. bits of wood, six inch nails through it, you know, cover it all up, put it in areas where. You don't, or you don't want vehicles to be coming in and out, uh, if that makes sense. And as long as the the, the farm workers know <laughs> know where these things are, um, it, it's a good way, really, of, of stopping people coming in at, in and out of your farm. And the other thing was actually sitting down with the farmer as well, and, and just going through and changing that mindset. Because when we drove into the courtyard, uh, there were seven vehicles in there, and six had keys in the ignition. Bloody hell. Uh, Listen, that that's a that's a bit of a no no. You need you need yeah. that, and it's a it's a culture thing. Um, so and and that's why my daughter helps because there was um, three two uh, two girls and the the mum uh, were down there, and it's always nice having uh, a softer a softer touch to what we're trying yes. to explain, especially when we do the training side of it. Uh, so yeah, that, so that that's really how how we want to help the the farm industry, you know, and and not rip farmers off, but you know, but unfortunately, the NFU, they, they just think, oh, that means we've got to pay for you. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, we're not going to do it for free, but we don't want to put the charge on the farmer uh, because if you put the charge on the farmer, nothing gets done because you're not going to pay. So yeah. the way around it, NFU, you know, they charge the farmers quite a lot of money to be a member. The insurance companies, you know, they reap in a lot of money uh, from the farmers, especially the ones that constantly get... get um, uh, broken into because all they yeah, do is yeah. they, they just keep rising their, their premiums like you know so maybe it's time for them to to give some back uh to to the actual farmers like you know and yeah and it really it's a it's it's a it's a win-win-win scenario for both the rural crime units the farmer insurance companies but trying to get that across to the nfu and the insurance companies it's just you know difficult uh, because they're just they're just happy to go with the flow at the moment. Uh, so so next next uh, August August the first when the new statistics come out from NFU Mutual, we know because uh, it, it was fifty two summit last year, fifty four this year. You know, it's going to be fifty six, fifty seven, and that and that doesn't really tell the full story because that's only NFU Mutual. 
yeah, uh, their yeah. statistics. So and they so they're only running uh, just under a two thirds really uh, of the farm and industry. Uh, so okay. the other you, you add the other third onto that, you know their statistics, and also more importantly all the non-reported crime. Uh, yeah. Then that that fifty four million will will wallop up to eighty ninety million, like you know, and that that's that's a lot of money. And in any other industry, uh, nobody nobody would get away with that. Uh, but they and if you do like you know they they just seem to be happy with with going with the flow like you know interesting that's weird isn't it that the they're, they're comfortable with that it, well it's the same as same as a retail you know the resale industry they budget for losses yeah. um, as opposed to budgeting for good security an issue in the security guards with a nice nightstick you know so that they can because we we keep harping on uh, that if, if somebody if somebody's robbing a store in front of me. I would pick up a can of beans and I would throw it so hard in the back of his head that he would rethink, actually, yes. am I doing the right <laughs> And And it needs that sort of attitude, really, from everybody to to start standing up uh, and not allowing these people to, to walk into, you know, Tesco's and, and load their bags up and walk out, you know, and because they, the retail industry are doing it completely wrong. You know, they're budgeting for losses, um, and uh, and they have a hands off with the security. Um, well, actually, uh, inadvertently, that's putting staff uh, and the security people at massive risk. Uh, yes, you know, it's only going to be a matter of time before someone actually gets killed uh, in the retail industry, like you know. And uh, and but it's all because what they're doing is they're encouraging criminals to come in, take what you want, guys. You know, and and uh, but it you know sometimes it needs members of the public to say, hey, and the officer off, you know take that can of beans straight at the back of the head, like, you know. Yeah, and, you have know it I mean? surgically removed. Yeah, absolutely, mate. Yeah, yep. absolutely. And it, it's it's just having a, a bit of a more robust attitude to, to criminality. It is. We have the, the whole society has got so soft. It's beyond oh, yeah. the blanket. Yeah. We do need to stand up for ourselves yeah, a absolutely. lot more and stop taking shit unnecessarily. Yeah, well, it, yeah, yeah, no, you're right. Because it, it actually stems from from you know stems from the government, and and it sort of felt us down, like you know, and and we are we, the UK is a bit of a soft touch, you know, disgustingly poor, so. Yeah, former old Maggie Thatcher and Winston Churchill, they must be turning in their graves to to think how how the UK yeah. is turned out uh, turning out, like you know. Uh, yeah. So yeah, a bit, bit of a shocker. It is. It's um. Yes, successive showers of shit, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, some, sometimes it just needs, um, you know, some people like myself and that lot just to start rattling uh, rattling a few doors and, and banging on this, that and the other to say, oh, hold on, you know, that, that's... Uh, and let's like say with the farm yeah. industry, all it takes is a bit of lateral thinking uh, and do something different. You know, I've seen, I've seen so-called security experts... Um, and they they write a really good procedure, um, you know. Procedure to a farmer is, you know, yeah. What the hell, they're not interested. In it. They want verbal and you know practical help, uh, not some garbage that you've spent hours and months sort of devising, uh, you know, nice little pictures and stuff like that. You know that you're yeah. doesn't you know, work, does it? Yeah, absolutely, mate. Uh, you know, it, it's it's back to basics, really. Uh, and going back to basics is is, is the way you're going to beat these criminals because criminals only know, um, you know, the the, the basic way. Um, and and the other thing as well is one of the first things we teach farmers is, is actually how the criminals operate uh, because if you understand how the enemy work, <laughs> it's a lot easier yes. to uh, it's a lot easier to 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 deal with them. Like you know, and yeah, um, and I think it's really now. Unfortunately, in the rural industry, the criminals are a lot of them are uh, traveler groups, um, and that's not me being racist. But you know, they've got easy access to farms. Eastern European uh, is is big because, unfortunately, with what's going on in the Ukraine at the moment, uh, there's, there's a lack of uh, yeah. agricultural uh, equipment. So anything that gets stolen is generally on the the next uh, ferry. Uh, from the UK straight over to Europe, um, and it's it's heading uh, to Eastern Europe. Uh, it used to be yeah. Poland, 
same as when the the you know Iraq and and all that lot was kicking off. A lot of the farm industry, agricultural machinery, was ending up in the the Middle East, like you know. So it's the same yeah. now, but it, it's going different place. We yeah, we know what's going on and 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 how it operates and that lot. So it, it's just you know being aware and and you know call me old fashioned, but the rural crime units they do a fantastic job when they can, but they're very much underfunded. Uh, and they're extremely undermanned. So we did a, a presentation in Wiltshire for the Rural Crime uh, Organisation down there. Yep. Uh, it, it was a forum, basically. Um, and, uh, and and we sort of stood there, and, and we actually told them exactly what they needed to know, not what they wanted to know, because it was all back, you know, slapping each other on the back, all these presentations. And then we turned up, did our one. You could see people, especially at the back, thinking, should we have invited this lunatic? Um, and it was, it was, you know, straight down the line saying that, you know, this, this is, and, and what we're trying to say is the, the, some of the rural crime units, because they're so undermanned uh, and they've got massive areas, you know, Wiltshire yeah. is the second biggest county uh, in the UK. Uh, and they've, they've only got uh, eight people, eight rural crime people currently really? in that massive area. Yeah, absolutely. And and we said, listen, you're you're losing the hearts and minds of the farmers um, because that that Dartmoor farm that I mentioned, the, the last time they saw a policeman was five years ago. Um, you know, a guy came and knocked on the door, and I said, you need five to be, years. Yeah, absolutely. Jesus Christ. Yeah, absolutely. I said you need to be. Uh, so the, the hearts and minds thing is gone completely, and a, a lot of the a lot of the farmers don't trust the police to actually do their job, and and you can understand why when you ring up. And say I've lost forty thousand pounds worth of equipment, and and all you get is a crime number. You know, yeah. no one comes out. Uh, and now we understand that because of the the police policy at the moment. So so the the actual guys doing the rural crime stuff are working really really hard. Yeah. But they they're not out. At, they're not out between one and uh, one and five o'clock in the morning or one and four o'clock in the morning, uh, which is when the criminals are really active. Uh, you know, the professional gangs. Um, they know that the Royal Crime Units are not going to respond. And and CCTV doesn't stop them. Monitoring devices, no no effect with them. Alarms going off. This has no effect at all uh, on the criminals. Uh, so, you know, we need to do something different. Yeah. Well, it's, it sounds like everything in, in true fashion is reactive and not proactive. And that's what you're trying to do is get it, flip that, so that you what you're doing is actually proactively preparing people for the eventual, it's going to happen. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, quite bizarre. Yesterday, we we um, we, we were trying to uh, myself and a, another security company are trying to get the personal safety situation awareness training and the breakaway stuff that my daughter does into yeah. into schools. And uh, there was a school in in Staffordshire who were really interested in doing it. Uh, and they they sent a, an email back to the other guy who's trying to trying to get it moving. Oh yeah, budgets and blah blah blah. But we'll have a we'll have a look in two years' time. Well, that decision will have a detrimental effect on the kids. Uh, if because these kids need desperately need to to understand what the risks are, and uh, especially when they're travelling uh, on buses, you know, from long distance, you know. And, yeah. All that sort of stuff. So, so a, a decision there by the school to say, "Oh, yeah, yeah we, we won't bother with that," um, you know, has an impact on the kiddies themselves. Like, you know, it's just a, a negative, absolute negative attitude to to doing the right thing. Uh, if I may say, we we were over in Leicestershire um, just before the summer break. Uh, I mean, Kitty went over there from the security industry. Asked us if we'd like to do it. Uh, and they they had a skills day where all these um, all these different organisations, police cadets, army cadets, RAF cadets, navy cadets, uh, girl guides, yeah, uh, all, all turned up really. Uh, and and we did seven seven one hour sessions. Uh, you know all the different. That's fantastic. And what came out of that was the uh, the girl guides were the the last group, and there was a very stern uh, uh, lady in charge of the. Um, and we 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 thought because she was really quiet and sort of, you know looking over her glasses, um, you know we thought oh, we, we've obviously upset her or whatever like you know. <laughs> anyway, she she got in touch with us um, literally as we got back, saying 
Uh, Mick, that was fantastic. Can we can we do all the gold guides of Leicestershire? Uh, so we've arranged to do that. So second of uh, second of fantastic November, um, and then and on the back of that, uh, there's a guy said, "Oh, Mick, you're doing the gold guides. You know, I've got an in into the Worcestershire." <laughs> Uh, the Worcestershire Go Guides. Uh, so it, it, uh, at the moment, it, it's very much word of mouth um, because the kids enjoy what we do. Um, and yes. and they, they do get a lot out of it. And a lot of that really is down to having my daughter there as well, you know, having that soft touch. And, and unfortunately with Keely, she uh, she does get throttled. <laughs> <laughs> we, we normally pick the sort of biggest person in the group and say, right, come over here. You know, um, and and start throttling her, and and just by using body mechanics, you know, pushing the elbows in and forcing them away. You know, this young slip of a girl could actually force somebody off when when they're actually strangling. Uh, and and she does say, "Listen, you know, put some pressure on there, like you know." Yeah. But when the kiddies see that and they see a young girl being able to do that, it just makes it more realistic, um, rather than yes. me trying to do it. Uh, because they'll go, yeah, but you're you're excess, yes, you know, blah blah blah. But they say, see my daughter doing it, um, it's more more believable. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, it makes good sense. Really, it's um, using your assets wisely, isn't it? Really. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and I think I think when I came back and we started doing this, it, it for me it was was a no brainer because I've got three boys in the military, uh, and my my daughter um, actually. Um, she she's of the same milk as the three boys. You know, she <laughs> got brought up with three older brothers, like you know, so yeah, yeah. you know, climbing, um, uh, climbing, skiing, all that sort of stuff. You know, she she's there, like you know, um, so she's quite a quite a hardy little little person, like you know, she's got a fierce and left hook. Um, and uh, for me, uh, be, because she works with my ex wife in a in a um, in a smoothie smoothie bar, I suppose, in Hereford called Kiki's. Yep. Um, I I just think you know there's, there's more to it uh, than serving people coffees and stuff like that. So every time we we get the opportunity, we you know we both go down there and do the training because it benefits it benefits me, benefits the company, and also benefits my daughter as well. Like you know because she yeah. she's learning new skills and and uh, this guy called Ginge Johnson and uh, and and um, you know other people, uh, Lofty Wiseman for instance. Yep. Um, Alan White, uh, another another cracking individual, yeah. who um, who you know sort of take her under her skin, uh, under under the wing light, you know, and uh, and she's learning and she's she's draining the their experience, like you know, and, and trying to trying to you know take it in and and able to pass it on, her. and it, it's great, you know, for the the older generation, um, you know, the Lofty Wisemans and the Alan Whites and the Ginger Johnson to to be able to pass that on to a little slip of a girl, like, right, you know? Yeah, and a fantastic skill set for her to have, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 they're all, you know, three gentlemen in their day. <laughs> uh, yes. Ferocious characters. But, yeah, but absolute, that's bloody sure. <laughs> yeah, absolute gentlemen, like, you know. So, yeah, no, it's it, it, it's great, like, you know, that that she's learning, uh, she's learning something else. So, so that that was my point, really, of coming back and starting up Hawks and Co. was to to do this for about five years, uh, and then uh, and then once we got uh, a few contracts, then just hand it over to to Keely and uh, and and then hopefully, you know, if when the boys leave the military, they can they can step into you know my role, yeah, uh, and then you know because we've got a younger breed of, of hooligans. <laughs> uh, sort of being able to, uh, yeah, pass it, pass it all on, like you know. So we've we, we've got good ties at the moment uh, with a company, and I won't name the company, but it's it's to do with penetration testing. Yeah. Um, uh, and again, all stems back from you know breaking into places in Northern Ireland, uh, yes. London with MI5, uh, and uh, to help them because they're they're a technical uh, organisation, and the, and the thing that they were missing uh, was that physical. Uh, person that can break into somewhere uh, and actually, um, you know, plug some into the network so that they can do their thing, uh, their cyber uh, stuff and all that lot, like you know. So, so fingers crossed that uh, you know that that'll uh, that'll help us. But that that's just another, you know, that, we we've got a, we're quite a diverse sort of training. You know, we do a lot of active shooter uh, or marauder and terrorist attack, as the police call it. 
Yeah, yeah. because yeah. We, we've been doing this since 2015 when the Paris attacks came in. Uh, yes. You know, so we've we've been doing it, and literally uh, 14 months ago, we were in Houston uh, teaching teaching my old organisation SPM offshore at the Houston office, uh, and the reason being is British. British security guys are a lot more level-headed <laughs> yeah. uh, than our American counterparts. Uh, and the reason being is, you know, we work on budgets. Uh, you know, we, we we can't put, you know, ballistic doors on, on everything. And and the, the, the funny story is the, the organization were on the seventh floor of a building in Houston, downtown Houston. Uh, so, you know, they've been advised to get ballistic doors and all this sort of rubbish. And we got there and went, listen, you're on the seventh floor. There's a good chance that, you know, a lot more people are going to be attacked before they even get onto your floor. So let, let's concentrate, you know, yeah. uh, applying a bit of common sense here. And it was all about really trying to, you know, escape routes initially. So on the seventh floor, so a bit difficult. Yeah, you're certainly going to be jumping out of a window. So that, let's find places in the building where you can actually lock down Um Yep. And bizarrely, uh, in in most buildings, it's normally the toilets that are the best places to uh, to hide because they've got inward opening doors, uh, which are normally heavy duty. Uh, but it means you can chop the door, you can stick a chop underneath the door, um, yep. and and secure the door basically. And as long as you've got someone laid on the floor with a foot against the chop, so that the cop, the chop can't be kicked un, under and sort of crushed in. And if someone does put a burst through the the door. Um, generally, people don't fire, you know, down on a door. They'll fire through it. Uh, yeah. So as long as you're laid on the floor, um, you know, you're going to be okay, like, you know. And there's no windows uh, for obvious reasons in a toilet. Yes. Uh, so nobody can see you. So, so that, that's generally what, what we do. We've been invited to a school um, not far from here, and it's a, an ex-military guy who is now, sorry, an ex-policeman uh, who is now a teacher. Uh, and uh, and obviously he heard about our active shooter training, uh, but he's asked us to come down there just to talk about uh, their lockdown drill. They've got a lockdown drill uh, for you know people turn up with a, a knife or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, so it'd be nice to. But again, word of mouth, uh, people people have seen what we do uh, and everything. We're, we're big into kidnap and ransom as well. Um, and and the reason being is. Uh, you know, we're competing against companies like uh, Control Wrist. Yes. Now, uh, we understand that they, they they own the market when it comes to because they deal with people that have got insurance. Well, call me old fashioned. A lot of companies don't have insurance. Yes. So they, they're Very not true. Privy. Yeah, they they're not privy to having uh, an expert come in uh, and and help them out. Uh, and th and this is where we come in, uh, if if that makes sense. And it, it's all about. You know, if, if you haven't got insurance and you're not alone, you know, the, there are organizations that, that can come in, do the control risk side of it, um, and uh, but be a bit more helpful. Um, and the reason being is control risk, when they come in there, uh, they won't get their hands dirty um, because it's, it's you know, insurance-wise, you know, so, so they don't negotiate. Uh, the, all they'll do is they'll, they'll advise, and it's a very hands-off. Uh, approach to to way they do it, uh, and I understand why they do it. Uh, but sometimes, you know, companies need a bit more, bit more of a, a standoffish um, sort of assistance, if that makes sense. So, so we've yeah. been on all the courses, and I tell you, I, I tell you why we got into it is um, is SBM offshore. We used to um, every four years we used to renew our uh, K and R insurance. Yeah. Uh, and um, and as part of the part of the changeover, um, the was a training package, uh, and um, and it came to twenty eight thousand uh, dollars, eighteen thousand dollars for training, and um, so uh, they used to invite control wrestling to do a two day workshop. Uh, now, trying to get senior managers from all around the world to do uh, sum up for two days is not impossible. So they, they would come for one day and then disappear, and then, you know, other people. So straight away, it was a, a waste of time. Yeah. Um, and uh, and the budget was exactly $18,500 uh, for, uh, for one person to come in there for two days to do a K&R workshop. And uh, the company said, Mick, um, can you do this? And I went, yeah, absolutely. So 
went off and did all the courses. Control risk, thank you very much for, for doing all, all that. <laughs> um, but it, it just meant that, you know, we could save ourselves $18,000 and, and make it more pertinent to our company. So rather than listening for two days, you know, the normal stuff that uh, control risk uh, uh, teach is actually making it more specific to to us. Uh, so we we cut it down to a one day, a full one day course, and then that allowed everybody to come in to 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 do it. Like you know, because two days is impossible. Yeah, uh, when you're when you're the head of uh, the country, Brazil, you know, you can't afford to take two days away. You know, going on a course like you know, so. So, uh, so it was a, a bit of a waste of time. They would come in, listen to the first day, because a lot of these people, they all they really need to know is the, the part that they play in a kidnapping. Yes. Uh, they don't need to know what he's doing over there. They don't need to do that. So the two days is totally wasted. So let, let's get that individual to come in there. So the, the finance team, you know, you come in there for three hours to, to do the finance side of the, the K&R side of it. Um, yeah. And then other people, the HR, you know, bring them in. Uh, so, so making it more specific and and a lot more high impact, make it a bit more exciting, uh, rather than just listening to you know, yeah. So that guy's going to be doing that job, and knowing full well that that's not your part of your job, like you know. So, yes. Uh, um, and 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 really, that that's how we got into training in the first place. You know, I took over um, as head of security for SBM Offshore in 2007 um and then just before we took over there was a, an attack uh, on the um the fpso mistress uh, yeah. down in the down in the delta region yeah, I remember that yeah absolutely and uh, and it, and it was a joint uh, joint venture sbm offshore uh, and agip uh, if i make it was a joint venture so unfortunately so what happened was they they uh, Militants attacked the vessel, took three hostages. Um, just as they were leaving the the, the Delta region, uh, the police, <laughs> the military turned up uh, straight away, engaged uh, the militants, even though it had three hostages on board. One hostage shot dead. The other one lost an arm, 7.62 straight through the arm, lost his arm. Uh, okay. Thankfully, the third one, had the common sense to to dive on the floor, like you know, and hope for the best. Uh, he survived it, uh, but I then took over uh, as head of security about eight months later. Went down there to do a security assessment of the vessel, uh, and found out that the, there'd been ten previous security assessments of the vessel. So I sat there, and looked through them all, and they all stated exactly the same thing. They so people had done the but they hadn't been actioned, uh, and and it was uh, it was a vessel really just waiting to be to be picked off, like you know. So we wrote a really damning report uh, that they because it was a joint venture. These two managers yeah. Uh, yeah. didn't want to take responsibility for paying for the security, so nothing got done really, which is why it got uh, why it got whacked. So um, did this damning report, sent it up to Monaco. Uh, and what they did was they decided to sell the vessel to Adjip. Bizarre, bizarre. Um, now it was Adjip's vessel only. Never yeah. been attacked since. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it's it's in their interest really to to improve the security. But when when you've got these joint ventures, uh, they don't work because uh, nobody's willing to to take responsibility, uh, especially when it comes to money. Uh, if that makes sense. But um, so took over that. Fifteen years later, when I left in two thousand, and we never had a single security incident in, operating in Nigeria. Was, um, at anywhere that was high risk environment, we never had a single uh, security incident reported against us. And the, and the reason yeah. for that is the I had really good directors um, and managers really uh, in SPM. And when we took over, we said, "Listen, you just had that vessel attack down there." There's no security procedures. You've got nothing. Uh, we had a blank canvas, mostly. So the first thing we did was we established a security culture. Uh, so anybody traveling to medium and high-risk environments, Brazil, Guyana, uh, you had to go through uh, some training uh, just yeah. to make you more aware, like, you know, of, of what you're doing. Uh, 
um, and they they allowed us to do that uh, if that makes sense and it was good on them really uh, but it, it then resulted that you know 15 years down the line zero security incidents like you know so so nice. just to prove really that if you if you bring in a security culture um, it it does have a massive uh, massive impact on the company yeah it's it and it gets it gets it gets forgotten about when nothing happens and they it the reason it's there gets almost gets eroded doesn't it yeah and it yeah. gets forgotten about and then people start to oh we don't need that anymore yeah and then budgets start to get cut yeah absolutely it, it's funny the guy that i took over from was uh, an ex um royal military policeman okay um, so uh, didn't really know anything uh, about the the offshore side of it um but he but he was a bit of a sociable and anim- uh, social animal and as you can imagine uh, I think he spent about six years in in on BI, uh, so new patch bar like the the back of his hand, like you know, and all the other <laughs> sort of social. So I literally when I when I first got down there, uh, the guy that was that, that was sort of handing over to me, yeah, um, you know, second night, mate, uh, let's go down to patch bar, and I'm like, oh, okay, then went down there, and everybody uh, pat him pat himself and all the other. Oh, mate, you've got a really hard act to follow here. You know this this guy. You know d- he does all this for us. You know he, basically he's used to live in Patsburgh. <laughs> yeah, but but you know I've had some good nights in there. Yeah, absolutely. But professionally, yeah, uh, nothing. Uh, there, the, you know, there was nothing like you know. So yeah, yeah hard act to follow socially. Actually, <laughs> 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 uh, not at all like you know. So. Um, yeah, you know, and and it, it's really it's just a matter of um, of getting your house in order. And, and with Nigeria, uh, it's very easy to, and, and you're fully aware, it's very easy to to um, you know get into that comfort zone, uh, let your hair down, or let let your guard down, uh, and and they're on you straight away, like you know. Yeah, the amount of guys that um, in the likes of Wari and Eckett would go out to bush bars and then wonder why they get taken. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and, and we, you see in Patsborough as well, don't you? They, you know, people get in a right old state, oh god, uh, yeah. staggering out the door, uh, and they, you know, and sometimes you cringe, uh, really. Um, you know, wandering around Lagos, um, uh, you know, that state, being a white guy as well, and you know, because yeah. white guys in Lagos straight away it's money. You know, it, it, it's absolutely. like a dollar. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, it, it's applying a bit of common sense. Thankfully, I was into my fitness out there. So, um, you know, people were in Pat's Bar. I was, you know, down the gym or whatever, like, you know, and, you know, yeah. and, and I was happily married as well. So, um, you know, I was, it's not not my thing, really. Um, and, and you do get hassled uh, by uh, quite a few people. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, when you're in bars, um, yeah. you know. Um, so, yeah, it was not my thing at all, mate. No, it's it's good. Yeah, it's all right for the, the the odd night out, but it's um certainly wouldn't want to be uh, spending that much time in there. No, it's um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, some of the some of the hotels, you know, they they great bars, um, and I think when you're socialising work wise, um, it's always good to go to a, a a sort of hotel because it's a more secure environment, um, and it means you can let your hair down a wee bit, have a few drinks, know that you're going to be picked up in in a secure environment. Yeah, uh, and yeah. then driven back to your house, like you know, as opposed yeah. to you know, Pat's Bar and some of the other jungle bars where yes. you know everything's open and you stagger out, and and you know if you've been identified, and that's the thing is people uh, they they get into bad routines, you know they you know the locals know that every Friday and every Saturday night outside Pat's Bar it's easy easy pickings for for mugging and and stuff like that, like you know. Yeah, there's no point making this is the whole your whole thing about you know teaching situational awareness as well is don't make yourself a bloody easy target. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny because when we do the teaching, uh, we always say, "Listen, um, what we've just taught you now. As soon as you start drinking alcohol, forget this. <laughs> you yeah. ain't going to remember it. You are not going to remember any of this once you start chucking the the pint." Accused. I tell you, tell you what's funny. So my daughter, she went through the training when she was nine. Okay. Um, so all my boys went through it when they were a bit older, but Keely was nine. Um, and it, uh, I didn't realize the effect it had on her. But when she went to senior school uh, and, uh, and then that age when they used to be going out for, you know, 
illegal drinking. Um, she was she she was the, the mother hen, uh, if, if that makes sense. Just making sure you know everyone was okay and and all yeah. that. Lot. And she did say, Dad, it, it was because you you know that all that training that you uh, and highlighted what the flaws were that, that it all it, it stuck with her, like you know, which is why we do training we we, we did a, a private school down in london for nine-year-old that uh, was um nine-year-olds it went nine to ten year olds okay uh, and, and it was just great you know and, and so enthusiastic to learn something different and especially the stuff that keely was doing because you know we were creating monsters like you know the- <laughs> <laughs> you know when when, when we teach kiddies we, we it's pure breakaway and and nothing else uh when you're doing adults, uh, we do a thing called Plan B. So if that doesn't work, <laughs> you know, yes, here's yes. here's how to quickly dislocate a jaw, or you know, here's how to dislocate yes. the elbow really quickly. And uh, but you can't teach that to kids uh, because otherwise you're creating monsters. You know, yeah. you know. Let, let me show you how to break a jaw. You know yeah. what we've done here? Just <laughs> just pure 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 breakaway ready for. And yeah. and and quite bizarrely, uh, there's a. A farming organisation uh, over in Cambridgeshire, they uh, they have a lot of um, uh, foreigners come over to obviously pick the uh, pick the crops and stuff like that. Because uh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So so they've got these big um, areas, uh, dormitories, and that lot where they they all stay. Um, or they or they sort of Friday and a Saturday night, lots of alcohol, drunk uh, drinking. Um, so the, there are uh, they call them prefects uh, that are in charge really of, of making sure that everybody gets to bed and all this sort of yeah. But a, yeah. Lot of the, a lot of these people have been assaulted uh, and attacked by drunken drunken people like you know. So we uh, they they asked us to go over and um, and uh, do a bit of uh, restraint training uh, right. and all the all the restraint training that they do uh, is generally sort of verbal uh, and hands off. Uh, so again, me and Kitty went down there and, and just you know try to to go through uh, all the stuff really that Ginge teaches all the doormen uh, how to do it. And yeah, basically yeah. You just ramp it up. Uh, so you know try and guide people away initially. Uh, if they're not if they're not taking that advice, uh, then you sort of be a bit more hands on. Yeah. Uh, right, right the way through. You know the the angry person that's not going to go. Well, yes, you are. <laughs> And, yes. and, and, and and it was and it was great um and, and quite bizarrely uh we said listen if you feel that you're at risk walk away uh go and ring your managers don't put yourself at risk just because you're a prefect you know if there's a guy there with a you know broken bottle and he's going to cause you harm just let him walk away and, and we were chatting to the people at the end and they, they said mick you're the first person that's actually said walk away um because they've got it in their head from their management and everything else so you know they've got to deal with it well no you don't you know if you're, killed, no. if, if you're in harm's way then you don't have to do it you, you bring your flipping line manager up you know he, that's what he gets paid for bring your line manager bring the police up and get them out to deal with it like you know it's, it's not you uh to deal with a person who's got a broken bottle in his hand like you know common sense stuff well Yes, it works, isn't it? It's that old the kiss yeah, principle. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Works. It works. I've got yeah. on a slight aside from the for just that's popped into my head when you talk, particularly with the the stress of all this uh, rural crime, in addition to the stress of running a farm because it's not easy. I know from being in in the, in, the, in the mental health side of things that suicide amongst farmers. The farming community has skyrocketed how much of an impact do you think this this the increasing amount of crime in at farms is having an, a, an effect on that suicide rate oh, i think i think it has a huge effect because uh, i think it's a, a combination of quite a few things yes uh, yeah, you yeah. Know, yeah you know if, if a farmer could be right on the bread line and then all of a sudden someone comes in and steals his tractor and and that and that could be the tipping point Yep. really uh you know what i mean so so any any form any form of criminality and, and we know it ourselves you know if someone breaks in our house um you know that's an invasion of privacy that, that's uh especially if you're a female it's a devastating so that's the same as these farmers because people tend to forget that the farmers are emotionally 
connected to the work, you know, the cattle, you know, they, they lose, they get a, a herd of cattle stolen, such stealing the children. Um, so it has a massive impact, really, on, on the farmers. Um, with the, and, this, and this is why I'm not a big fan of scumbags uh, that take advantage of farmers because uh, they'll, they'll do something that they think is clever, stealing a tractor could actually have tipped that farmer over the line and, and all of a sudden he's, he's decided to take the, uh, the route of committing suicide, like, you know. So, so it, has a, it has a huge impact, uh, believe you me, like, you know, the farmers are under a massive amount of pressure, you know, pressure yes, yeah. from the, 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 the retail industry. Um, you know, they, they, all the big markets, you know, they, they want milk. That's why a lot of dairy farmers are giving up milking uh, because they're not, it, it doesn't pay uh, at all to, to do what they do. Like, you know, it's such a lot of pressure. Um, you know, we the farm here, they, they've just, or they've planted uh, all the potatoes. Um, now, we haven't had yeah, the best yeah. of summer uh, and the, a lot of it, a lot of them have died. Uh, so, you know, weather conditions have a massive effect. So, uh, you know, there's a lot, a lot of things. Actually, farming industry is about a really difficult industry to be in, in the first place, yes. uh, because you've got so many variables um, that that can affect uh, weather, um, the market, uh, yeah. and then all of a sudden, some scumbag decides to steal your equipment, like you know, and yeah, it has has a, a massive impact. Believe you me. Yeah, it's um something I'm very aware of here in uh, in Aberdeenshire. Um, similar yeah. to, to Herefordshire, you know, it's very, it's very rural, very fu uh, farming focused in, in all sorts of ways. And it's, you know, it's, 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 um, it's a bloody hard job to do. Yeah. What, what gets me is, you know, I'm not a farmer. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just a security guy that, that wants to help, uh, help farmers. But, um, if, uh, if any of you were as passionate as, as me, as a non-farmer to help the farmers, you know, life would be a lot more simple. Uh, but for yeah. some reason, they, and if you just, you know, mutual and the insurance companies, you know, they, they, they don't factor in that human factor of the farmer themselves. You know, they, they need more help. You know, you can't just, NFU, for instance, uh, NFU, for instance you know, they've, they've got a website and, you know, these are the security guidelines. Oh, that's, you know, that is a cop out. You know, issuing yeah. guidelines to a non-security person is like, you know, ish, issuing them um, gobbledygook. Uh, it's going to go over the head, like, you know. So, you know, go and put an arm around them. Go and help these people, you know, be be a bit more proactive with them, like, you know. And uh, But like I say, you know, if, if if we're as passionate about this, then why aren't they? And, and they're, they're in the industry, you know, they're, they're in it. And, you know, I only live on a farm, um, you know, but I know that I can help farmers much better than, than what they're being helped at the moment. Like, you know, and it proved yeah. it when we went down to Dartmoor and going over to Cambridgeshire, you yes. know, we, we, we can help just by, by doing something different um, and, and not ripping the farmers off. Like, you know, and um, like I say, the NFU, you know, they, they earn lots of money. Insurance companies, they always make money. You know, what yep. they, they always say, yeah, we lost a bit of money last year. Yeah, but, you know, the following year, they sort of doubled, you know, what they lost before, like, you know. So insurance companies never, ever lose. Uh, so hold on. Why not put some up back now and, and help, the, help the farmers a bit more, um, you know. And so that, that, that's where I was trying to go from. But, you know, we're, we're really, really passionate uh, about what we do. Um, yeah. with, it kiddies, with it kiddies, um, farmers, retail, um, you know, anything really, because uh, it's all about helping people. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, 65 now, so I'm too old in the tooth, really, uh, to be, you know, thinking, right, how can I make money here? And, there? And, uh, you know, it's, you know, we're, we're all about, I've got four kids. Um, yeah. you know, it's We've got a lot of fam family values uh, still in there, yes. like, you know, and, um, very much a hands-on uh, type uh, company, Hawks & Co. Uh, you, you can't join Hawks & Co. unless your name's Hawks. Uh, so that keeps it nice and small. <laughs> I think that's reasonable, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because I've seen, you know, I've seen the big companies. I've seen the, 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 the best and the worst uh, in these security companies. So I left the military in 2000, um, you know, ended up 
place you go to a place like Iraq and Afghanistan and I just seen how how badly these security companies operate all to do with making oh, money. They're um, horrendous. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and um some of the stuff they were they were doing and, and, and trying to get people in the UK because because uh, uh, one of the big companies actually undercut everybody to to get a contract uh in Baghdad. Um, and and what the impact of that having was that people that were on a certain wage one day, um, because they they'd undercut and they needed to to bring in a lot of fresh fresh people, yeah. uh, it meant that people lost lost out. You know, they they were literally um, getting half the wages that they were on. So Tuesday they were getting this wage, Wednesday they were getting half. Um, yeah. Now uh, unfortunately. Um, about sixty of their employees decided that no, that's not, and and literally went to the airport and flew out, like you know. But but that's that's what security companies were doing, and then to fill their places, um, they were putting people uh, that had done a, an SIA BG course, bodyguarding course, uh, over in over in no military experience whatsoever, and not even a police background, but done the course. So literally a two or three week course, right? You're now qualified. You're now in Baghdad, you know, uh, yeah. in a high risk zone, like, you know, and uh, it's not fair honestly, on anyone. Yeah, it, it's actually quite scary, um, especially when you're you're operating on the ground where, you know, in the military is great because you, you can rely on people right next to you, left and right. Yeah. You know, you're all the same, yeah. the same ilk. But when you're operating in a high risk environment with people that you have no idea, um, and you know, before he came out here, he worked in Tesco's, and now he's got an AK-47 running around uh, behind you. Um, you know, it's 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 ridiculous. But and that and that's you know the the bad the bad side of the security industry. And unfortunately, it happens all the time. Yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, which is why really I took on the role of doing all the training myself. Uh, so from 2000, because I used to teach uh, when I first left the military, uh, the very first job I got uh, was actually teaching. So we really just carried that on, uh, yeah. security, but also, um, you know, the the uh, head teacher, uh, if, if that makes sense. And, you know, we got all the qualifications and everything else. Uh, but it just meant that I can control it. Uh, and also the standards um, were maintained. Uh, you're not dropping it. Um, funny story again. Uh, uh, the, the there was a training session on with SBM off, offshore when I first got there. Yep. So I managed to go back to Monaco to sit in on it. Uh, and there was we had a lot of complaints from the the guy saying, "Hey, what the hell? Um, you know, none of that is relevant to us." So and and I totally agreed with them, like you know. But so without without embarrassing the the instructor, uh, thank yep. you very much. Great, blah blah blah. But, we said to the security company, listen, um, not for us, uh, so we're going to do it internally. So Mick's going to do it. Uh, so we, we literally just you know, took, uh, took took the lead on it, like, you know, and um, and taught the company what they needed to know um, because a lot of their security companies, when they go in there, it's like heat courses, you know. they, they Yes. A lot of the heat courses, they – are actually pretty irrele ir irrelevant. Uh, you know, you could do a heat course in two days rather than everybody going for four days, like, you know, uh, yeah. you do a heat course uh, because only certain elements of that course is actually relevant to individuals. Uh, so you need a bit, of, a bit of foresight, really, to go in there, speak to the client and say, listen, um, yes, there's a heat course, uh, but what's relevant to you? Right, okay. We can now do this. We don't need four days to teach that. We can do this now in two days. Uh, let's just crack on with it, like you know, and and, and yeah. do it and make it more more relevant for individuals rather than sitting through. You know, four days is is a long time on a course. Yeah. When two thirds of that course, you don't you don't even know you don't even need that stuff. You know what I mean? So uh, this is a bit, and then just make that two days really high impact and exciting. Uh, that they, they're going to learn from it, like, you know, and all the medical is good. I know that. We, we know that. But there's some elements of a heat cause that are totally relevant for uh, some people, like, you know. Yeah, absolutely. It, you know, the more imp the more fun you make it, the more people will remember it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and, and make it more beneficial as well. 
because yes. uh, I, you know, I got into medical when I when I was in the regiment. I they said right, uh, medics or Dems, uh, I'll do medics. And the reason being is, uh, you know, I I had three young boys, uh, so uh, it was more relevant outside. Yeah, uh, yeah. you know, because when I go home, I'm not going to blow a tree up. Uh, but if one well, of the kids, not normally, you know, it, yeah, <laughs> if a kid falls out of a tree. At least you know, at least you can. Although my my uh, ex wife did say never ever, <laughs> never ever touch my kids. You know, treating them uh, if that makes sense. Oh. Purely because I, you know. Um, I got called Doctor Death once. Uh, <laughs> other people died. Uh, <laughs> apparently, my bedside manner is not the best, uh, if that makes sense. And and you know, we used to do a lot of hospital attachments and stuff yes. like that. So, well, it's a bloody good course, that medics course. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I we did uh, Birmingham initially, so we met up with um, a guy called um, uh, um, Porter. Um, I've got what his first name is, but he was the one that uh, in, invented this app uh, with a load of other clever people. Uh, he's a yep. professor, uh, Professor Porter uh, from Birmingham. Um, fantastic bloke. Um, uh, but got this app, uh, this app that came out, which actually I um, I uh, actually try and advertise at the end of my all my training because it's a really good app uh, to have uh, on your your mobile phone. Yep. Uh, if I may, because because it, it it brings everything down to uh, basics. You know, if someone gets stabbed, uh, it just it just tells you really how to how to deal with the stabbing. Uh, you know, if someone gets shot and stuff like that. Funny old story. So in uh, in Monaco, um, so 2015, when we had the big Paris attacks, um, we then yes. decided yeah, yeah. to yeah. So we and that's when we did the active shooter. Uh, or what to do if you're involved in the terrorist incident outside, you know, in the, on the street yeah. uh, training. Um, but we, what we tried to do was we, you know, um, the first aid at work course. Um, yeah, that, that's good if you sort of got a splinter uh, or, you know, you're feeling a bit faint. <laughs> um, you know, so, sometimes you need some, a bit more. So we, we approached the Red Cross and also the equivalent in France uh, and Monaco. Uh, and said, so, listen, how about adding um, high velocity penetration uh, injuries, uh, eye blast uh, or gunshot? Uh, and they, uh, insurance, no, we can't do it. Oh, okay, then. So what we did was we, we just took the, took the initiative. Uh, so all, all our medics uh, within SBM offshore, um, when we used to go around, we, we just added, uh, right, you know, so we, we spent literally two hours uh, teaching them how to deal with a, a gunshot wound. Yeah. Um, and, the, and the reason being is, you know, you can deal with a gunshot wound quite easily to save someone's life. But as soon as someone sees a gun, because it looks a lot messy and, and quite horrible, I suppose, when you're looking at it, yeah. people automatically assume that that's way above my, my pay grade. Uh, and I really don't do anything. They, they don't get their hands dirty. Yeah. Uh, so, so our theory being, listen, you know, as long as you don't mind getting your hands dirty, let's get stuck in there, and that's actually saved someone's life uh, by by being able to deal with it, like you know. So, yeah. so it was great, and 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 everybody really took it on board, like you know. But I was just surprised that the uh, medical companies, because of insurance, you know, can't be teaching that because if someone does die, they they're going to sue us. Um, type type uh, attitude, like you know, because because yes. in this day and age, you know, you, medics especially, because medics are the forefront of everything. You know, if they get there first, they're going to be saving lives. So so let's give them just a little bit more to to think about. You know, when they because not everybody's going to faint and not everyone's going to have a splinter in the street. Uh, yeah. You know, the, their injuries are going to be a lot more uh, a lot more trauma type injuries. Uh, so let's give them that that confidence, really, uh, of uh, of dealing with it, like you know. And, it, and it, anyway, it went down. So we we did it with all the. So went to Brazil, went to Guyana, um, Monaco, nice. Rotterdam, uh, Malaysia, China. Yeah, it was good. Good. And it's, it's 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 an essential. Well, ever increasingly essential, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, absolutely. I love that. I I love that course. I did my 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 hospital bit at um, Luton and Dunstable and got. A lot of gunshot oh, right. knife wounds to deal with. 
<laughs> like li lively place, Luton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we we me and a, a guy called Al Moorcroft, uh, we did it in Birmingham, um, yeah. for, because we were on the anti terrorist team at the time. Yeah. So we we had to be the closest. So we they gave us a Range Rover. Uh, off we got to Birmingham, and we we drove. <laughs> So we drove past the the hot the, the the nurses, you know, you know, like knickers hanging out the window and all that. Yes. Sort of. <laughs> Me and I was just, we looked at each other, went fantastic. So we we went in there to sign in and that lot, and uh, and it was Keith Porter. Uh, yeah. So right accommodation, we went. No need, Keith. We we've actually seen it. They went. No, you ain't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're you're going into Breeze Block Tower. We were like that breeze block tower. What's that then? It was a tower made of breeze blocks. <laughs> really, really bland, uh, and it was where the visitors went. Uh, so okay. Yeah. So so yeah. So our expectation really of fantastic four weeks went out the window. <laughs> it denied again. Yeah, absolutely. But it, but it was great. Uh, really good working. I'll tell you what was bizarre. We had, there was two um, two lads really from the fire service. Um, okay doing their para paramedic training. Um, but they had a list of what they had to do. So they were there for two weeks. We were there for the four weeks. Um, and they had to do, you know, putting the cannula in, uh, they had to do 40 cannulas. Well, that's all they did for the for the whole two weeks that they were there. All they were doing was cannula. They, they had to be there waiting for someone to come in so they put a cannula in. Um, and... Uh, and, that, and actually, they never quite got to 40. One of them got 33 or something, and the other one 32. Uh, and I thought that was just ridiculous, because you, you can put a cannula in about two or three times, and, and you're happy with it, and just crack on like, you know. You yeah. don't have to do it 40 times, um, because you're missing out on, on all the other stuff that you can you can be oh, yeah. learning. So, but, I, yeah, I was lucky. So I did, I did Birmingham for four weeks. I did Newcastle for two weeks. Um, yeah. London, oh, Royal London, fantastic. So that's uh, a good hospital, that yeah, Whitechapel, yeah. Uh, and it was good because we, um, they've got the Hems, the helicopter, yeah. Uh, and the Hems helicopter is uh, normally booked up. Uh, if, so if you're an observer, which we would have been, uh, they, it's normally booked up two years in advance, and then you know, two regiment lads, well, it was me and a, an SBS lad. We turned up and, and we got priority. <laughs> so yeah. I, I did I did the Saturday and the other lad did the did the Sunday light. Like, you know, fantastic, really Brilliant. good. Yeah, yeah. And, they, and the other thing is they they had a big uh, Audi Audi Estate, um, and it and it was a fast response vehicle. Uh, so you had a paramedic driver uh, yeah. and then and then me sort of sat in the passenger seat. Um, and this Audi, as soon as the call came in, it would it would get to the site a lot quicker than an, an ambulance. And then what you do is you stabilise the patient, uh, get it all squared away, uh, then the ambulance turns up and then you hand it over to the ambulance uh, and then uh, and then you get ready for the, the, the next call. So we did this for two days and it was brilliant because the, the paramedic never even got out of his driver's seat. He just looked over and went, Mick, got this? Uh, yeah, yeah, happy. If, if you're happy for me to get stuck in, yeah, yeah. And he just sat there, really, and did all the paperwork uh, that needed doing. Uh, and he, he allowed us, he, he gave us a confidence to, to get stuck in, uh, if that makes sense. And, and the, the bizarre thing I learned over that two days of doing it, apart from, you know, getting your hands dirty and getting stuck in, uh, is how many people live in London that don't speak English, um, bizarrely. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's quite staggering. You, yeah, like you've got the Jewish quarter, the Ethiopian quarter, uh, the Turkish, uh, the Turkish area, the Indian, the Sikh, and all that. Yeah, it was just bizarre. Um, yeah. You know, especially going up North London way as well. Like you know. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's um, my my one of my dad's uh, younger. My dad was a bootneck as well. One of his younger brothers was a was a bootneck and left, joined the fire service. Was in um, North London, Stoke Newington. Um, and so, right. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's quite a a, a, a Jewish area, if I remember yeah. correctly. What he said. Yeah. So, um, yeah. What I remember. But uh, but yeah, there's all sorts of shit going on there. Oh, absolutely, mate. Yeah, I absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But I, I always remember they busy because um, you know, Tottenham uh, is also an area where it yes. was quite heavily Jewish. Yeah. Uh, 
if that makes sense. But yeah, no, all these all these different areas, and, and I, you know, massive noticed that when I did that two year stint with uh, MI five, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you you really do get to know to know London, the, the you know the the sort yeah. of rough areas. Um, another time because uh, there was that Irish connection as well, still still yeah. sort of ticking on. Uh, so getting to know all the the, the the Irish part of town, like you know, and uh, yeah. all the all the familiar pubs that the that the boyos would use. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Busy. great great night, but um, yeah, yeah, well, that's twitching. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it was good because um, you know if a, if a player went in there, uh, they'd need a couple of guys to go in there, like you know, um, and um, so you'd go in there, and you know, you're allowed to. To drink alcohol because no nobody go you know everyone looks at yeah. you buy an orange uh so the boyos are sat in there sort of drinking and and getting merry uh, and you go in there to buy an orange it looks a bit bone so you just go in there and be very gregarious uh, you know as, as uh, and drink sort of alcohol and, and try and remember that you're still doing a job <laughs> yes uh no it was good yeah, yeah, yeah. Really enjoyed it like you know but it's good to good to get to know london um like the back of your hand really yeah yeah, there's a, and there's there's a there's a lot of interesting places in London. Yeah, yeah, I must admit the because the, the, there's parts of London. To be honest, you know, we walk around Lagos and places like that, Port Harcourt. Uh, some parts of London, you know, um, make your hair hair curl uh, at yeah. night time. Uh, you think flipping hell? Would I like to be walking around here at night on my own, especially for you know female? The answer no, no. Good God, no. Yeah, and, it, and it's getting worse now, unfortunately, because of the, I hate to say it, but the illegal immigration that's coming in, uh, you know, they're, 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 unfortunately, they're, they're uh, making society not the safest place at the moment. Um, and a lot of it is because of their customs that they're bringing over. Yeah. Uh, they're bringing in their customs and, uh, and expecting the UK to be of the same ilk. Um, but it isn't, you know, the touching, touching females while they're walking down the street is is a bit of a no-no. But in their yeah. culture, uh, you know, it's deemed as acceptable. Uh and and that's where you get a lot of the problems like, you know. Well yeah, you've got to you've got to uh, you've got to adapt and integrate and conform, haven't you? Yeah, but uh, unfortunately they're not. Uh and and that's causing a, a major drama. You know, I, I hate to say it, but um, you know, I I I can see the UK uh in the next five years just exploding. Um, uh, two ways really yeah one by uh, illegal immigration that's coming in by the thousands uh, not you know it's not being checked uh, but also by um, people uh, what the government sort of class them as right wing extremism but just concerned individuals really uh, worried about their, their kids and, and everything else and, and I think the, there's only so much really uh, that the general population will take uh, yes before it explodes. and unfortunately when you do get these like um like demonstrations and whatever um they generally always get taken over uh by the by the half wits um, sadly you know, yes yeah and then all of a sudden a peaceful demonstration by concerned individuals uh suddenly becomes a right-wing extreme uh demonstration because you know a few hooligans Decide to uh, you know to rob stores and stuff like that, and and, yeah. that, and that's unfortunately that's part and parcel really of uh, demonstrations, uh, peaceful yes. or not, they will get taken over um, by the by the dregs of society that that want to um, want to use it really for their own platform and their their own agenda. Yeah, it yeah it's it's there's a there's a long history of that, isn't there? Unfortunately, but you're right. I think that you know we are a punchy nation. And we will only stand for something, stand and watch something for so long before, you know, if it's affecting the your yeah, life I mean, too much, yeah, it will, yeah. it will, it'll reach the flash will go bang. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, it took that spark. So that that guy that stabbed uh, three three kiddies, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, the thing. Now, you know, it's all well and good the government trying to, you know, keep the the person that. You know, because because all of a sudden the the guy the the guy that stabbed these kids to death, mainstream uh, media was was showing pictures of him as a young kid. He was short on. Yeah. Hold on. You know, this is a this is a fully grown adult now. He's eighteen years of age, and and has just gone in there and stabbed 
three little three little kiddies like you know that that's yeah. not that's not you know make him you know he's the he's the victim of all this because of the way he was brought up and blah 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 he was born in Cardiff you know the, and that and that's really what what really annoys and then you have the the Manchester uh, incident where the yeah. violence erupted there and every all the focus was on a, a poor old policeman that actually kicked someone in the face yeah well, you, Purely because you never actually saw what happened before that, and and to be no. quite frank, just about every military police person that saw that would have done exactly the same thing. Absolutely, um, he's lucky so, that's all that happened. Yeah, absolutely. But again, you know, it's all driven by the government and the mainstream uh, thing of, of trying to make it into summit. And and all of a sudden, you know, all these people that are at the riots, you know, getting thrown in jail, fast tracked into jail. And these scumbags at the Manchester airport still walking, walking around, even though you know they uh, they assaulted, especially the female female officer uh, that yeah. got assaulted. Yeah, they're, they're walking around, and and you wonder why people um, say, yeah, two tier, uh, you know what's going on, like you know, and, like and it, audience, it, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's so you can understand the frustrations of the people, and and the government need to listen, ready to to the people. Because uh, uh, they'll they'll tell you if you're doing something right or, or well, they, not. They need to, and they're being taught. They're not listening at the moment, are they? I don't think they're prepared. No. What I found really interesting was that that from um, that all that stuff around Stockport, wasn't it? Yeah. Was um, people when the people being interviewed? They said it's got no, don't give a shit about religion. It's got nothing to do with religion. It's it's basically to do with these ill-disciplined wankers. Who are just taking advantage of a soft system? Yeah, yeah and they yeah. don't, and they're not. They shouldn't even be here in the first place. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which yeah, I absolutely. find an absolute disgrace, personally. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. You know, when when pensioners get their heating, uh, you know, their, their fuel thing taken off them for the winter, um, yeah. yet we're allowing people to live free of charge in hotels, fed. Uh, and yes. everything else, and, and you know the the government harping on about saving money. Well, stop the boats, uh, give the pensioners back what they deserve and what they need. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Imagine, imagine if a pensioner dies um, because they've got no heating. Uh, the impact yeah. that that's going to have, uh, you know, and again, that's going to spark off. You know, a lot of people are going to be really, really hacked off uh, because they've done it. Like you know, so yeah. Dodgy, my, dodgy times. my my you know my dad my dad's an ex booty he's 80 they they've they're both obviously my parents are pensioners um they live in a live in, live in a flat if theirs goes my, my dad's got prostate cancer at the moment I know. You know, so i just and there's lots millions of other people in a similar position it just grips my shit as a yeah, say. Yeah, no, absolutely yeah, absolutely. And, and that and that's you know, someone I'm I'm quite vocal on LinkedIn. Uh but they uh someone put on there the other day and I said, listen, the single most uh single most dangerous element for this for the, the country at the moment is actually the Prime Minister. Yeah. Uh yeah. you know that because of the ideology that he's following at the moment yeah. is gonna put the UK massively at risk uh internally. Yes. Uh, and also externally, you know, are we ready for another Manchester Manchester attack? Well, no. Um, you know, Manchester was seven years ago. Um, yeah. I know um, the one of the mums, uh, Martin's Law that they're trying to bring in, uh, which was actually devised by one of the mums uh, whose son died. Um, her name's Finnegan or Finnegan, somewhere or other. Um, anyway, she's doing a great job. Yeah, uh, with a, with a with a good sort of crew around her, uh, trying to push this, um, and uh, but that's seven years ago. What you know? What the hell? Uh, what's been going on? You know. So in that seven years, we, we've been over in Europe teaching um, active shooter uh, what to do if you're involved in a, a terrorist incident yes. or marauder in terrorist attack. The the thing about our training uh, when I when I first advertised it on LinkedIn when I got back, um, the there's a couple of police arms, uh, police armed units, uh, or individuals that used to work for the the armed uh, police arm side of it. Uh, they said, "Oh, you, you can't be teaching that," you know, blah blah blah. Um, and the reason being is, is I uh, 
the way they teach it, it's all geared towards a police response, um, if, if that makes sense. Yes. We don't. We, we <laughs> forget that. Um, so all our teaching is, listen, you've got to deal with it. Forget the police. You've now got to deal. Someone walking into your business with a weapon, you yep. have to yep. deal with this. Uh, you know, you can't be can't be relying on anyone else. Uh, so all our training is really geared towards no police response. You yep. listen, yep. you deal with it. So what what they when the police do their teaching, they teach specific individuals uh, of how to you know how your role, blah blah, is to do this. Well, that's great. Um, until that guy loses the back of his head, uh, and then and then who's who's going to do his role? Uh, exactly. if I might, yes. So, so the way we teach it, so we we get the cleaner. So we'll we'll go into a, a, a an establishment a, a organization um, into the office place, uh, and we will t and we will teach everybody. So the first thing we do, we'll spend two hours doing personal safety, situational awareness training. I right, got yep. that out of the way. Now next two hours is going to be. Um, active shooter. So, uh, and we spend an hour going through the theory side of it, and then we do an hour practical uh, of you know uh, what can we use for a weapon, um, where can we hide, you know where where are the 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 ideal locations that we can actually try and hide from as an individual. Uh, but it's all about subduing that individual because, uh, and what we what we try and you know I know it's a bit a bit grim. But if you're in a room and you've got one exit and a guy walks in there with an AK-47 and there's 10 of you in there uh, and you do nothing at all, that's 10 of you dead. Simple yeah. as that, right, you know. Um, and it's saying that, you know, one of you has got to grow a set of kahunas uh, and go for it. But you can't actually say that. You can't say, right, like, your job. Uh, because nobody knows how they're going to react to gunfire until the day of the races, uh, if that makes sense. So, so, again, police mentality of teaching, um, you know, the, the person that they're teaching may get shot at, uh, and if he's not killed, he may panic and run off, and, you know, who else is doing it? So if we teach everybody now, from the cleaner to the CEO of the company, they all understand their options when it happens. Yeah. It means that everybody's on the same sheet of music, uh, if that makes sense. And, the, and then what you're looking for, you're just hoping that on the day, uh, somebody takes the takes the lead and, and taking this individual on uh, yeah. because it's not it's not an easy thing to do and and what we're trying to explain to people is to survive a active shooter you may unfortunately have to take a life uh, to to survive it uh, if, if that makes sense and but yeah. people need to understand that if if you know that beforehand so classic example uh, we. You know, I said we used to teach all our officers all around Europe, uh, yes. all around the world. So the office in Monaco, when we, we said, listen, we're going to teach active shooter, um, there's a lot of scepticism. You know, the worst thing that happens in Monaco is somebody spills their pink champagne on their toes or yeah. on their shiny boots. Uh, so there was a, anyway, a lot of the people that work uh, in the Monaco office live in Nice. Yep. So we did the training, blah, 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 a bit of scepticism. Eh. Then we have the Nice attack. Uh, yeah. eight, 87 people killed on the promenade. Yep. Um, and it, it's just, thankfully, no one from SBM was involved. Uh, but there were a, a few people that were up in that area that automatically just click into what they've already been taught. Yep. Um, memory. Uh, and, that, and that's what, yeah, what, and that's what we're trying to, that's what we're trying to get across to people. Uh, but again, difficult because organisations, uh, until it actually happens, uh, are not willing to to be proactive uh, in their, their training. Because believe you me, if you've got confidence uh, and you've been taught and you understand what your options are, it just gives you that that uh, better chance, really, yeah. Uh, yeah. of uh, of getting out of it. Uh, if that makes sense, because otherwise you're just going, <laughs> you're just copying. Uh, and following people without any any plan, uh, and if and if following your plan, <laughs> yeah, it can be quite a dangerous plan. Uh, yeah, yeah, you right, can. Yeah, because I don't know if you're, you're aware, but in when the Paris attacks uh, kicked off, um, uh, there was a lot of people that ran, um, but they actually ran towards where the shooters were. Uh, 
yeah. and the reason yeah. being in, in a built up environment when you fire an AK forty seven, um, because of the, the 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 sound effects all over the place, you can't actually. So we always say, unless you can actually physically see where the gunmen are, uh, don't automatically run. Uh, yeah. You know, just get yourself down nice and low. Uh, and then, and then try and work out where you think the gunmen are before you actually make that decision. But nine times out of ten, people when they hear gunshots, automatically will start running. And uh, and that's what happened in Paris. Uh, a lot yes. of the people ran directly towards uh, where the gunmen were, like you know. So, but if you understand that, you know that beforehand, um, it, it just nullifies um, you know that that incident happening, like you know. So, yeah, we'll get there. Well, we can but can but try, mate. It's weird because you know when after after Manchester, I had this. I don't know whether it was a because we've been had a certain level of training and seen how different organized you know terrorist groups work, etc. I had this. I don't know whether I could call it a premonition or just a prediction that something that, that there would be a change in tactics. And I expect I thought it would happen in the UK, where I knew what I would do: strike in the heart of Middle England. In a and just car, cars full of guys, guns turn up and just slaughter everyone. The response time would be nothing. Yeah. yeah so you'd be yeah. in and out. Nobody would know. And just you'd have a dead village. Yep. Yeah. But it happened in Israel instead. Yeah. And I was I, I knew I, I had just had this feeling that that would be the, the the kind of track that they would go down because if you want to strike terror into the heart of a nation, do that. Jesus Christ. Yeah, we're, we're, we're as close to uh, another terrorist attack than we have been for a long time. Uh, yeah. if, just just by the way we are, like, you know, and, and this is why we're trying to trying to get across, you know, are we ready for the next terrorist attack? And unfortunately, we're not. Martin's Law is not even out yet. Um, you know, no, no one's really... We, we haven't learned the lessons. Um, and I, I put a post on the other day about how important situation awareness is and then I, I actually highlighted the fact that the, the Manchester bomber stood out like a flipping sore thumb. Yeah. You know, uh, it was hot weather. He had a black jacket on, and he wore, and he wore a, a big uh, backpack, date, um, Bergen. Yeah. Um, and looked Middle Eastern. Now, call me old-fashioned, but that is really suspicious. But he, he walked past police. He walked past the emergency services, got into the, you know, and you're like, that. what the hell, you know? Yeah. Now, if people are more switched on, situationally aware, um, they would have recognised that. Now, you're not going to, they're physically not going to be able to stop him from exploding it. But what you can do is make sure that people are, you know, out the way, uh, yeah. if, if that makes sense. And, you know, because yeah. someone, so, you know, you always get the doom, the doom, you know, yeah, but, you know, what happens if he blows his pack up anyway? Well, yeah, you're obviously going to die, but at least you've done some of it, uh, trying to uh, stop other people getting killed. Uh, yeah. but that's that's part and, part and partial, really, of dealing with terrorism. You know, is. Uh, th there is a good chance uh, that you may get hurt, uh, but you know, ultimately, you've got to live with yourself. And if you do nothing at all, and and you know, you just allow this person to walk into the Manchester arena. Uh, into the auditor, into the the you know the, the, wherever yeah. it was, um, uh, and kill quite a few people. Um, you know, you're not really. Uh, it's not going to sit well with you, like you know. No, wouldn't me. Yeah. So we're, yeah. So we're, we're not ready. Uh, which is sad fact is we are not ready for another uh, Manchester type attack. Um, you know, and but it, it's funny because I, I brought my, my daughter tickets to um, HCDC. Okay, uh, and uh, my my ex wife went as well, Kim, and um, and it's always in the back of your mind that hold on, the concerts are fantastic, you know, it's, uh, like terrorists at the moment. You're thinking, right, Oasis, what a what a fantastic place to yeah. detonate detonate a bomb at an yeah. Oasis concert, you know, and and because it's easy easy to do because we haven't learned the lessons from. You know what? What? What happened in Manchester? Unfortunately, no. no it's almost it, it's almost giving the impression that we're actually being set up for another one because we've yeah. been, we're yeah. allowing so many people in, and we're just so lax and so soft within policing. 
Yeah, absolutely, because because it's very hands off now, uh, if that makes sense. So, you know, suicide bomber. Um, you know, it's easy to deal with a suicide bomber. Just destroy the brain, um, and the brain is not able. Then, you know, that's that's why you double tap a few times uh, yes. for the brain to cease any 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 movement going on, like you know. Yep. Um, so, you know, if you've got a baseball bat and you smash him straight across the, you know, the the, the head and damage the brain, uh, there's a good chance that you know he's not going to be able to carry out what he's doing, like you know, but. But we're very, we're very hands off. No, no, you know, you can't be doing that. Okay, let's go. Yes, we fucking can. Yeah, um, you know, and we should. Absolutely. So we, we, we need to be, and and I do it on LinkedIn all the time about, you know, we need to be more robust. Uh, we need to be a bit more self sufficient and uh, and yeah. just get on with it uh, because we are we are turning into a nation of flipping wusses. Um, yeah, and, agreed. And a lot, yeah, a, a lot of it though is is the policy, you know, the even the police policy uh, at the moment. You know, they the police look when they're dealing with their riots and stuff like that, unless of course it's right wing extremism. But if they're dealing with normal, they they just look an absolute embarrassment uh, the way they yes. do it. You know, they're not, they're not cracking schools. You know, if you to do, bad people need to be dealt with severely. Uh, you yes. know, and and pushing people away and trying to trying to wrestle them to the floor, you know, a good kick in the uh, in the head, uh, and a good you know batting across the the back of the head, yeah, will sort yeah. people out like you know. But they we're not we're we're being taught um, slightly different, very hands offish, uh, very very weak, uh, and and you know when you've got weak pathetic leaders, uh, that felt was down, uh, and it and it becomes. We become very weak and pathetic nation, uh, and yes. and that's the way we're going. Unfortunately, unfortunately, you remember, remember when the that failed terrorist attack at Glasgow Airport and that guy drove a VBID, and the and the that fantastic Glaswegian bloke was the guy his, his car the terrorist car caught fire and he caught fire when he was burning on the ground he ran up and booted him so hard in the bollocks he broke his foot, <laughs> and quite rightly so. Yeah, uh, but that that really. More yeah, that, that summed up the, the attitude of Glasgow, which is great. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, personally, I wish we had that in London. Yes. Uh, so, someone someone did a sketch uh, the other day, a comic thing about, you know, the, the Scots are looking over the border and thinking, hold on, if Russia can invade Ukraine, then we can invade England. <laughs> At the moment, yes. <laughs> you know, can you imagine, you know, all these Glaswegians coming down and taking over Cambridge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <A> walkover. <laughs> yeah, absolute walkover. Uh, oh, and his mitigating factor was, yeah, that's why we've got Newcastle. Uh, we've got Newcastle <laughs> up there to, to really slow the Scots down, <laughs> to give the Londoners time to, to pack their bags and leave. <laughs> dear, oh dear. It's, it's, it's yeah. insane, isn't it? I just... Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's dangerous times, unfortunately, uh, on the horizon. Um, which which really compounds why um, nobody's listening to why why we're trying to help people like you know because uh, okay. we we certainly need it. Well, I'm gonna do my absolute damnedest to 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 spread the word for you. Thanks, um, I do have a friend who works in NFU, so I'm gonna make sure that he watches this. I tell you what, I I, I actually sent thirty emails. Uh, so there's fifteen board members uh, yep. ish. Uh, so I sent 30 emails uh, about, you know, how we can help. Uh, and out of 30 emails, uh, I got one reply from a deputy director, female, um, and, it, and it was a brush off. Uh, it was, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll hand it to our, I'll hand this to our security team. Hold on, you haven't got a security team, uh, you know. Uh, and yeah, if you yeah. have, they they ain't doing a very good job, like, you know. So, yeah, it was disappointing to to get, you know, Bobbed off, uh, not not even invited yeah. to sit down and, and explain what we're trying to do, like you know. And uh, but like I say, if if, if they were as, as passionate as us, uh, then the farming industry would be in a lot better hands. Uh, but unfortunately, they're not. It's all about you know yeah. how much we can we can get. And and farmers pay a lot of money to the NFU. Yes, uh, to be members of the NFU, they also pay a lot of money uh, for insurance. You know, a lot of these farms are uninsurable. 
because the, the premiums are so high now, uh, the farmers just they can't afford that. Like, you know, it's, uh, and yeah. that's why you get a lot of unreported crimes now. Um, like, yeah, they can't, it's not worth it. There's nothing. No, absolutely. Yeah, Take absolutely. And, yeah. And, and, and you, you know, you wonder why um, farmers commit suicide. Like, you know, it's, um, yeah. um, you know, that, that little incident of rural crime could actually just tip them over the edge. Like, you know, well, so, you know, my, my, my job ultimately is about helping to save lives to make people feel better mm. and part of this will be continuing to promote what you do yeah absolutely i must admit that when, when you're teaching kidders and that lot the, the, we have a fantastic feel good factor at the end of it yeah um yeah. quite a bizarre thing we we went to older shop um and uh and it was kiddies that were learning difficulties um and we we got called in uh with the headmaster initially a female uh, and she, she sat us down and she said, listen, mate, just, just to warn you, um, these kiddies are, you know, difficult, learning difficulties and, and quite can be quite disruptive. Uh, so some of you say uh, may may be the trigger or whatever. Uh, so just just be aware. Uh, my response was, if you, if you can if you can teach a, an SAS squadron, you can teach anybody. Uh, so we we went in there and it was great. Because we we allowed the doors to stay open. Um, if a, the kitty got bored, because uh, you know two hours is quite yeah. a quite a long time, really. Uh, so uh, we allowed the doors to stay open. The kids could go in and out, you know, because uh, some of these kids have about fifteen minute max um, attention uh, rate, and then you know they're out in this. So we try to make it as as chilled out and and easy going uh, and fun. And when when we I teach. Like I am now, yeah. uh, flip flops, uh, sweatshirt, and a pair of jeans, because kids don't respond to suits. Uh, you know, when the police turn up, they're um, so you know where they're you know tattoos, you know, nice and chilled out and easy going, um, just to make the kids feel a bit more relaxed, I suppose. Um, but anyway, it went great. Uh, you know, and, and yeah, some of the good. kids were just some of these kids might are just stars, but they're vulnerable. Um, and they're vulnerable on the street, and which is why we taught them. Uh, it yeah. wasn't about what's going to happen in the school here. It's about these vulnerable kids now being on the streets, and that and that's where we were trying to help them. Nice. So at, at the end of it, um, the uh, the teachers uh, said, "Oh, Mick, can you can you come back in a month's time and teach the teach the teachers?" Um, because they, they some of the teachers feel a bit overwhelmed as well. Uh, yeah, and yeah. vulnerable because you you know a couple of these boys that, that are sixteen years of age are quite big units you know what I mean they're quite big lads yes, uh, yes. and some of the teachers are quite quite you know small and delicate um, so we we went down there and spent the whole day with them really uh, doing uh, personal safety situation awareness uh, a bit of uh, de escalation uh, yep. uh, and also um, um, the um, uh, you know how to how to escort people out, because the way they've been taught is all hands off and verbal. Uh, now, unfortunately, that that has actually got a couple of the teachers hurt. Yes, uh, yes. So, but but it's the way the government do their teaching. So they said, "Mate, can you uh, <laughs> can you just show us a few a few things really uh, uh, of of how we can grab these kids and and move them out?" And what 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 we try to get across to them is, if you've got a child there uh, who who comes at you with a knife, forget that it's a child. Completely forget that. Yeah. You deal with that quite aggressively to, to, to try and get it off them. Yeah, so yeah, never, yeah, so never ever worry about hurting somebody whose intention is to harm another person, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and and it, it just goes against the, the grain of what their, their mentality, you know, oh, it's a young, young girl. But a young girl with a six, uh, you know, a, a sort of uh, twelve-inch knife blade in her hand uh, is a potent force, as we saw in Cardiff. Uh, yes. A few months yeah, ago. yeah. You know what I mean? So, uh, has has to be dealt with quite, quite firmly, like you know. So, uh, but but yeah, no, it was it was great. So we went back down, uh, spent spent all day with them. Funny funny thing is, um, and this is why it's good having my daughter with me. So we went into the home economics room. <laughs> Uh, they had more blades and knives than than SAS have got in Hereford. To be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 
and this is an open classroom, and and, yeah. and it was my daughter that picked up on it. Uh, she said, uh, "Excuse me, but you know, you do realise you've got a lot of implements in here that can cause a lot of harm." And I think it embarrassed the one of the head teachers uh, because she was walking behind us with a big tray. <laughs> Picking all the knives up <laughs> and then locking them away, and and they've yeah. got a big tape in there, uh, so she she locked them in the safe, like you know. And it's again, it was all just common sense, you know, walking around the school with the teachers and, and just you know they, they were saying that uh, they've got these, uh, they wear their ID cards around the neck. Yeah, uh, they were saying that some of the some of the teachers have actually been strangled, uh, and you're like that. Well, take them off. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you've got something on there that you've already identified is a risk, then nullify it by taking it off and maybe just put your ID cards uh, on a you know these cords. Yes, that you clip onto your belt uh, and you just pull it pull it out rather than having something around your neck that that can be used to to strangle you. Like you know, it's just. But again, all common all, sense. You know, me and my daughter were looking at each other, going, you "No." Know, don't wear it. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, chance of being strangled. Uh, don't wear it. Uh, you know, it's all already. It's, but it, that it is was, with the quick release things as well. They just it just pulls apart as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, <laughs> no, absolutely. So uh, yeah, it was all. You know, teachers supposed to be clever, uh, clever and common sense. Just don't go the same if that makes sense. So no, not very uh, often. But but they were they were great and uh, and they and I really did enjoy teaching the kiddies uh, because yeah. you know ultimately you've got to realize that these kids are on the streets are very vulnerable um but they they were fantastic they were really good to you know and some of the kids coming up asking questions we actually taught a school uh, the whole school uh, in uh, in Gloucester and it was a catholic school um and uh, bizarrely uh, a lot of the Gloucester rugby players actually uh, come through this school because it's Catholic. Yeah. Rugby orientated. Now, me and my daughter are staunch Leicester Tiger rugby fans. So the second slide up <laughs> was a big Leicester, <laughs> Leicester Tiger. And a, and a quick reminder of the score between Leicester and Gloucester that season, because we've beaten them twice, uh, if that makes sense. And, uh, yeah, and it really, it, that was our icebreaker. Good banter. Uh, argument, yeah. But they, they, unfortunately, they, so we did each year group. So we did five one hour lessons, um, started with the, the eldest, uh, and then went down to the, went down to the youngest at the end. We should, we should have done it the other way around, but there you go. Um, but they, the, the, the only downer really were the t teachers were quite strict. Um, and you could see that they, the kiddies wanted to ask questions. But they would look over, and they, the teachers were sort of giving them a, di a dirty look, as if to say, "Don't, don't, okay, you know, don't open your mouth." Yeah, which is that's a shame. Which I, I thought it was a bit of a bummer, uh, really, because uh, the kids, you know, kids do like asking questions uh, uh, and everything else, like you know. So uh, it was yeah. So my down it was great teaching the kids. Uh, teachers just need to chill a wee bit and allow the kids to be a bit more free. Uh, to ask uh, to ask questions, yeah. but again, we we found doing it that way. Uh, so spending an hour for each year much easier because you, you then do the whole school in on mass, uh, if if that makes sense. Uh, unfortunately, we only had an hour per per year because ideally, to do what we do, it's, it's a two hour two hour lesson. You know, personal safety, situation awareness, personal yeah. safety, forty minutes, situation awareness, forty minutes break away 40 minutes so a two hour lesson really uh, gets you through but we we can reduce it to an hour um, um because we work one we one we work within budgets um right okay yeah 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 uh, and the other one is we we work within the time frame that the that kids have so kids have only got an hour for instance uh then then we'll we'll knock it down you know it'll be yeah. 20, 20 minutes 20 minutes and 20 minutes which is a bit rushed um but you know, it's if they've only got an hour, then you do it. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so the the yeah, doing all the girl guides up in Leicestershire. So the the lady that we thought was very standoffish, yeah, uh, turned out to be really nice. 
she, uh, she the first thing she said was, Mick, uh, you know, can you tell me how much this is going to cost us? And I went, you tell me, uh, rather than me give you a costing, you tell me how much your your, your budget is and, and you're prepared to pay and we'll work within it, uh, if, if that makes sense. Because, yeah, yeah. you know, when, when you throw numbers at people, it just, you know, uh, one, they don't do it. They're, sorry, we can't afford that. Um, and that really is to the detriment of all these girl guides. The girl guides yes. need training. Uh, you know what I mean? So, you know, if they can't afford that amount, then then let's work within your budget. So we, we always say um, that we'll work within your budget. You know, you, you tell me what you're comfortable paying. Uh, we'll work around it, uh, if that makes sense. And, uh, yeah, and absolutely. That, and that's what we do with the farmers, you know, go down there and, you know, you pay my fuel, pay for my fuel down there and make me a bacon sandwich and we'll just crack on with it, like, you know. Yeah. There's always a way, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, costings, you know, security companies, first thing that goes through their mind is making money. Yeah. Um, yeah. As opposed to how can we help you um, and, and do things and, and that, you know, Whatever your budget is, we'll work within it rather than just saying this is how much it's going to cost. You know, like that eighteen and a half thousand uh, dollars for two day workshop doing kidnap and ransom. Ridiculous. Yeah. You know, all, all companies can afford that. So that's why they do it. Um, most companies can't afford that. Farmers can't afford. Uh, the average farmer can't afford. Um, you know, ridiculous amounts of uh, recommendations to improve his security. Uh, yeah, and I'm yeah. I'm not a big fan of CCTV and and uh, electronic gadgetry and all that sort of stuff, um, unless the farmer itself, uh, you know, they've switched on with it uh, because yeah, it's a waste yeah. of money. You know, it costs thousands and thousands and thousands, and the farmer leaves the gate open. You know, it just defeats the yeah, object. Yeah. Um, and, then, and then looking also at at, um, at the criminals, they're not bothered about CCTV. You know, they've got a mask on. You know, yeah. CCTV. What you're doing is you're just recording a crime. Uh, police are not going to catch them. They'll have changed the number plates way out. Uh, so if, you, if you're going to put cameras out there, probably best to find a layup place where you think that the criminals are likely to, to uh, come in and change their registrations and put their masks on. Yeah. Uh, and st stick a couple of covert cameras out there, like, you know, uh, and, then, and then hopefully you, you've got enough uh, enough information then to feed back to the police uh so that they can uh they can go through the database yeah, uh, yeah. But, but people don't you know that they, they don't think of that you know let, let's get nice big cameras all around the thing and you know people masked up and away they go you know that, like big metal barns uh, so people will spend a fortune um big metal barn uh they'll spend a fortune you know securing the door blah 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 Criminal turns up with uh, with with a bolt, <laughs> a, a bolt thing. No, yeah. he'll, do, he's, he'll undo the bolts on on the side of the the metal, you know, because it's yes. all, all put together with bolts. So it's just he's just got a ratchet in his hand. <laughs> and Happy just, Larry. Yeah, he'll just take a side panel off and uh, and go through the side of the barn like you know. Uh, that's what criminals do. You know, they're, they're pretty pretty canny, clever lads. Uh, yeah, they're so, daft. Yeah. We were saying, if, you, if you've got a metal barn um, and you've got all nice shiny bolts on there, then round off all the nuts. <laughs> yeah. Uh, especially the ones that, you know, uh, uh, easily accessible. Just round them all off, like, you know. So because otherwise you'll get criminals coming in there uh, and they'll just use a, a ratchet and they're, they're in the side of your barn, like, you know. Yeah. Yeah, quick and simple. Yeah, well, that's criminalities, mate. You know, these are... These people are in jail, not in jail for a very good reason. They're good at what they do, um, you know. And people always assume that criminals are stupid. <laughs> Far from it. Uh, you know, they, these are, you know, their they, their university is a university of life on the streets. Yeah. Um, and they're very good at what they do, like you know. And you you take them, uh, you know, you you assume that they're stupid, but it's going to cost you, and and that and it's costing the rural industry, um, you know, badly. Uh, because the the farm industry is not is not keeping up to speed with what they what they're doing. They're not changing. Uh, they're just going with the flow. Uh, yeah. Not helping yeah. the farmers. Uh, they're, they're just not being passionate enough, really. Uh, no, it doesn't sound you know, like it. Jesus. Yeah, and because if you if you've got passion to fight um, fight anything, um, 
it has, you know, your opposition then, you know, it yeah. makes him start thinking, oh, flipping hell. Uh, when you're, when you're, when you just roll up in a ball on the floor, which is what the farming industry is doing, no criminals are looking at you thinking, oh, okay, we'll just carry on, then, you know, and, and just, you know, um, and doing what they're doing, like, you know, it's just shocking, really. Um, they, the crappy attitudes, uh, really, of the, the NFU and the in insurance companies, you know, they should be doing a lot more. Well, let's, uh, yeah, see what we can do to hold them to account and uh, change their attitude. <laughs> attitude is everything, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, Mick, I've, it's been very, very interesting for me. I've learned a lot of, from you today from, from what you're doing. I know, you just looked at the time, flipping out. Fascinating. It in a way. <laughs> I know, it's good, but that is, you know, we've covered a lot of ground. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, yeah. there's, there's, I have no doubt that there's a lot of people are going to take, take away, uh, you know, even if it's just one, one thing from what you, you've, you've, we've talked about today, you've come out with a lot of, a lot of tips and advice and, 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 and the route that you're taking with your business, I think is absolutely invaluable. So more power to you, mate. Well done. Yeah, thanks. And uh, like I say, we, we are struggling at the moment uh, because people are not, buying into it i suppose not not literally buying buying into it but they're not they're not buying into the concept uh yeah. of, of trying to uh look after people and and you know help help organizations uh, you know this, this company that have got involved with us yes doing the testing they have uh they've, they've actually seen our worth um but it just you know just not say i i would rather be working 24 7 to help people uh, than just sat here reading about again another farm has been broken into another farm has committed suicide uh, yep. another kid has been harmed on the street um, you know because yep. they're, they're, they're not aware uh, what's going on you know the simple thing about just putting your mobile phone away and taking your, your we call them the crack cocaine buds you know if you're walking down the street in the city and you've got crack and you've got um, earbuds in your ear you might as well be on crack cocaine because you haven't got a clue you know yep. what's going on no around idea you. What's going on. You know what I mean, your, your two senses, your eyes and your your ears. You know, you're reading to it uh, and you're listening to some it. You're blind, absolutely blind to criminality, like you know, and yeah, um, and and that's what kiddies do. Um, and as soon as you say, "Listen, just put your mobile phone away," because how, how many times and we try to explain this to people? I I could go into uh, the middle of Hereford, yeah, stop naked and stand right in the middle of Hereford, start naked. And somebody, so before the police come and arrest me three hours later, before <laughs> the arrest me, um, somebody will bump into me. Why? Mobile phone. Yeah. Um, and, and you see it every day, walking down the street, you know, people have to dodge out of the way because someone's on the mobile phone looking and reading a text message like, you know, the, the, there is no job apart from maybe a doctor on call, but there's no job ready where you you should be walking are reading a text message at the same time. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's just, you know, uh, common sense. Just step to one side. Have a quick look around first. Get your mobile phone out. Quick read a bit. Yeah, happy with that. Mobile phone away. Continue walking. Yeah. All common sense. But, yes. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's lacking. But I think I think the tide, the tide is beginning to turn because of what's being pushed out on uh, social media and on the news in terms of how how um unsafe society is becoming that i think i think the tide is turning yeah absolutely uh, like i say one of our biggest platforms is linkedin um and the reason being is it's uh, people of the same ilk really yeah um so we we're, we're really active but so on average we'll, we'll do at least one or two posts every day even at the weekends um and, and a lot of it is just reminders uh really and, and we're, we're just hoping that somebody you know, oh, all right. oh, oh, that's a good idea. Um, you know, because we, we, there's a guy through LinkedIn um, rang me up and said, oh, Mick, can you come over to Ipswich um, and uh, and teach personal safety and situation awareness for two hours? Because they, they're engineering, rail engineering organization. Okay. So a lot of lone workers. Um, and then on the back of that, he said, oh, Mick, can you, uh, can you also do a motivational chat <laughs> yeah. um, to our office staff? Uh, now the office staff apparently they um, you know they do a lot of whinging you know because they're sat in the office 
um, you know, the hardship of being in the office and that lot. Yes. He said, it'd be good, Mick, if you can come there and, and then at the end of it, they can go, must be enough. So being in the office is not that bad after all. <laughs> yeah, a little <laughs> shake up. Yeah, absolutely. So so we've got, we actually got a banner made up, uh, a rolling. So we've got two rolling things uh, for the farm industry, two for doing personal safety situation awareness, and then yeah. one um, about motivational talks. And, and it's really based on the book uh, that we've got, um, Life on the Edge. Um, yeah. um, which, so we're on that one, we're, we're hoping that it will be uh, out for – March next year, and the reason okay. being, uh, it's the Hay Festival. Um, the Hay Festival in uh, just out uh, just outside Hereford, really, um, and uh, they've got the book festival there. So, being a local author, uh, there's a, a good chance. Still got to go through the MOD uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, yeah. but there's, there's nothing in the book at all. You know, I, I've learned from reading books, Billy Billingham's book, and a load of other people's books. Yeah, uh, yeah. And what you can say and what you can't say. Uh, but it, uh, the book's not a it's not a Bravo Two Zero it's not a Billy Billingham book um, it's really about the individual um, family man uh, and, um, and and all the pitfalls in life so you know starting off where you know 16 years no 15 and a half uh, being turned down by Lincoln City uh, with a football trial yep. to snapping his ankle uh, at the age of um, 17, or 17 and a bit, um, and then being told you can't parachute. You know, all these little setbacks that you get in life, uh, but how yeah. you circumnavigate them and, and never, you know, I did SAF selection with a pin in my ankle, you know. Don't don't let little things like a pin in your ankle stop you doing what you want to do like, you know, uh, yeah. if that makes sense. I've got metal in the back of my head, uh, in my brain, uh, that severed the hearing on the right-hand side. Again, you know, can be a bit of a concern, I suppose, but, you know, don't make a drama out of it. You know, at least I've got my legs and I've got my arms. Uh, to come out of the SES with, you know, a bent finger, a pin in my ankle uh, and a bit of metal in the back of a Swede and stone deaf in one ear, it's actually not a bad... <laughs> Pretty bloody good, mate, actually, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely. But, but it's having that attitude as well of, you know, nothing's a drama. Same as when me and Billy got captured. Um, yes. You know, it wasn't, wasn't a major drama. It, it could have been, uh, I suppose. You know, it could have been a major drama. Yeah. Uh, but we just, you know, just didn't make it. Didn't make that drama. It's gone on with it, like, you know. No. i tell you what, though. I, I, thinking that we haven't touched on it today, but it'd be good. I think that'd be an interesting, a, a good chat with you and Billy, actually, to, uh, to talk about the whole, the capture piece, because having the three of us having been in a, in that sort of position, yeah, yeah a, good, a good chat to share to compare notes. <laughs> yeah, well, Bill, Billy's back in the UK in two weeks' time, um, okay. and um, normally we we RV at the Cozy Club, <laughs> uh, the Cozy Club in um, in Hereford. Yep, uh, and have a ridiculous about a red wine, and I uh, normally end up being his photographer. Uh, okay, because everybody recognises Billy, um, and all the ladies. Uh, like to have their photograph taken, and, and Billy being Billy, Billy's far too nice. He never ever refuses yeah. um, uh, a photograph with people like you know. So yeah, I end up spending most of my time stood up you know, taking a you know taking pots. Yeah, <laughs> nice um, but but um, you know planning on having one glass of wine uh, and having about six uh, six red wines. So. But it, it's always good to catch up with Billy and. Um, and we, we always said that um, because, you know, people remember things slightly different. It's the same event, uh, yes. but people do remember things slightly different, uh, if that makes sense. And and uh, we always said that it would be really good to, to actually talk about it uh, when we're actually both together, uh, you know, if that makes sense, and, and, and seeing, seeing his yeah. side of it. Well, maybe there's, if you, when, before you have your glass of wine, <laughs> mention it to him and then uh, maybe we can wangle it maybe i'll come down to uh i'll come down to hereford yeah absolutely and, uh, yeah, absolutely. and we, can, we can do it do it in the same room then rather than yeah. Uh, yeah. with wine yeah absolutely <laughs> right talking of wine just a couple of bottles <laughs> good man <laughs> well, i like to see uh, so, someone said if i don't make you an alcoholic uh no 
because if I was an alcoholic, they'd be empty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I just like collecting wine uh, and, and bottles of JD um, and stuff yep. like that. But also, I also collect um, uh, antique memorabilia, uh, sports yeah. memorabilia, because um, it, it, I think it actually looks quite well together. So this is a little corner uh, of a sitting room, uh, yep. you know, and it, it's just, you know, nice to sit down and, uh, you know, not have a television on over there and, and just, you know, maybe have a little glass of wine. Yeah, I'm partial to a glass of wine every now and again. Well, if you're, if you're ever in this part of town, mate, um, you've got a spare room upstairs, mate, you're more than more than welcome to... Uh, um, yes, so, likewise. Uh, likewise, if you're uh, when you if you if you're north of the wall again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Plenty of room. So yeah, not a drama. Listen, <laughs> Nick, it's been an absolute pleasure, mate. Thank you so much for today. Um, thoroughly enjoyed it. Really interesting for me personally, being you know selfish bastard. Um, yeah, really enjoyed it. So thank you for your time. Yeah, my- yeah, my my pleasure, mate. And and any time, uh, you know, and if, if there's anything else that you can think of a topic you want to talk about, uh, always always happy to chat. And like I say, we're we're not the we're not the sort of people that um, will come on a podcast and be reserved. You know, uh, podcasts are all about opening up and yes, talking yeah. about your issues and stuff like that, mate. So totally uh, yeah, agree. More, more than happy, mate. Okay, all right. Well, let's let's um, wrap it up for today. Let's. Uh, yeah, have a chat with Billy when you see him for your glass of yeah, wine or two. Absolutely. We'll never just never say how big the glass is. That's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, we always go large. Yeah, always go large. Yeah, there's, no, there's no point. Go, go bigger, go, go home. home. <laughs> 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 Excellent. All right, mate. Well, thank you again, and uh, we shall speak again soon. Pleasure, absolute pleasure, mate. Cheers, mate. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Mm-hmm.